We're so thrilled today to have uh, Dr. Andrea Beyer, Assistant Professor of Biology at Virginia State University. Andrea, you can take it away. Thank you very much. You, I titled it From Farm to Phage, and that's mostly because I'm a farm girl, and I really never expected to be a research scientist teaching at an undergraduate university. So I wanted to share with you today a little bit about my journey, how I got here, talk about some of my research using bacteriophage, which are viruses that infect bacteria. So as I mentioned, I grew up on a farm in West Central Pennsylvania, and growing up, it was really encouraged for me to be a housewife. And if I had any sort of profession, it was expected that I would do something more feminine, such as go into nursing or be an accountant. Um, and I honestly, as a kid, wanted to be a truck driver. That's I grew up with a lot of men in my family. They were either farmers or some of them drove coal trucks in the region. And so that's something that I just thought was really cool. Um, but the longer I was in the farm area and the longer I was in high school and doing different things, um, and I also heavily participated in Girl Scouts, I started being exposed to different things that made me realize that I think I wanted to do something different and I wanted to do something more. Um, but my farm origins really did play a part into where I am today. But just a couple of pictures here, we raised cows, pigs, chickens, and all kinds of stuff. We still have the family farm in Pennsylvania today. Um, that my dad runs. What really made me like science though, as I mentioned, was through my education, um, middle school, and but most heavily in high school. The teachers that I had in my life were the people that influenced me to go into science. Um, and I saw a lot of overlap, especially when it came to infectious diseases. As you can imagine, living on the farm can be a dirty place. There's a lot of germs. And there were a lot of instances of viral outbreaks where we had to vaccinate or take care of our animals when they became ill. And so that leaned me more towards thinking about microbiology. But what did I know about it? I, I knew nothing. And I sure did not know anything about going to college because my parents uh, both went to high school but never went on to further their education. So middle school, I had two I'll just say crazy science teachers that really were fun and made science exciting and, and interesting, uh, Mr. Smith and Mr. Cosmac. And I say crazy because they did things out of the ordinary. Um, and some of them I have on this bullet point here, but I remember that they had us do these things that we would look at them and be like, why Dr. Cosmac, are you having me do a commercial about this planet and trying to encourage people to come and live on this planet? We had to look up um, planetary facts and compare it to earth. Um, just really fun, silly things, but it really made science exciting and interesting and allowed for us to be very creative. But really, it was in the high school that I had a biology teacher who had us out doing things that I could see easily fitting into everyday life. Probably the one that really sticks out to me was a stream study. We went out to our local uh, hunting and fishing club and collected water samples and did all sorts of analyses and then we were able to plug that information into a um, Pennsylvania conservation website and they were collecting that to look at stream quality. And she explained about all the different parts and aspects about acid mine drainage from the area, how we salt our roads in the winter time, how that affected um, the things living in the stream. And I just thought that was so cool. Um, and some other things that she really influenced me in towards thinking about college was she told me about her time at Penn State getting a master's degree, and it really made me realize that women could do science. Now, most of the time we see men depicted in textbooks um, in different places for science techniques and learning new inventions and technology, um, and she made really, really made me realize that women could do science too. So that's what got me started into pursuing a career path um, in the sciences with biology as my focus, and I had no idea what I was doing. As I said, I'm a first generation off the farm girl, so nobody in my family had gone to college before, really didn't know how to apply financial aid because we did not have a lot of money. We certainly didn't have money to afford college, so finding scholarships, um, that was a big, big thing that it was scary. And I, like I said, I didn't know what I was do doing and neither did my family. Uh, my mom was really instrumental in kind of going out there and pulling resources to help me along the way, um, as well as Mrs. Stifler, that biology uh, teacher that I just told you about. Um, and then so, some other family members who kind of told us their bits and pieces of experiences and what they knew. Um, so I ended up enrolling at an all-women's college in Allentown, Pennsylvania called Cedar Crest College. 
And what really, really drew me there was they had a four-year program in genetic engineering. Um, back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, genetic engineering was one of those buzzwords and it just sounded very interesting and exciting. And it combined biology, which I loved in high school, as well as chemistry that I did very well in. And it was applying it to this new field of cloning. Um, you probably remember about Dolly the sheep when she was cloned. Um, things like that, that really got me excited. So I did four years at Cedar Crest. And um, what really helped me pursue where I am today is the fact that they had a freshman research experience there. So my very first semester at this campus was I was doing research with viruses, uh, viruses called bacteriophage that infect bacteria. Um, and I'll be telling you guys more about those later, but this is really where my research pathway began. It was It was part of a class. I had to do some research. And so I got started with these bacteriophage and I did research for three and a half years out of my four at Cedar Crest, which is kind of unheard of. And I realized I liked research so much, I did two internships along the way. Um, one was with the New York State Department of Health shortly after 9-11. So right down uh, the hall from when they were doing anthrax testing, um, I got to be there around that time. And then also I did an internship closer to home doing breast cancer research. Because at that time I was like, maybe microbes are not for me, maybe I'll do something more molecular biology and genetics. Um, so I two really great internship experiences that influenced that I really like to do research. Um, but also along the way, I started doing some teaching to fellow undergraduate students. So I started thinking about teaching. And that really became more evident when I graduated from undergrad and decided I wanted to become a doctor. I wanted to be the first PhD in my family and become Dr. Byer. Uh, so I went to graduate school at Penn State College of Medicine in Hershey, Pennsylvania. If you can't tell, I'm a deep-rooted Pennsylvania girl. Um, and in graduate school, I got my PhD in microbiology. Um, and a big part of my training there was I got a lot of experience teaching uh, medical students, other graduate students, and high school students, and realizing how much teaching was an important part of my life and something that I really wanted to embed in my career. Um, so while at Penn State, I did my research on viruses related to HIV. These are called retroviruses, doing a lot of genetic studies with those. Um, so after I got my PhD, the big question is usually what next? And so for a lot of students such as myself, when you're not quite sure where you wanna go, you, you continue on as a, in a postdoctoral position. And I was really lucky to be afforded an opportunity to do what's called an IRACTA postdoctoral fellowship. ARACTA is an acronym, stands for Institutional Research and Academic Career Development Award. And what that mouthful essentially means is that it's a three-year postdoc opportunity where you're doing research, which is what you typically do in a PhD postdoc in biology or biological sciences. Um, but I also had formal teacher education, meaning I was trained to be an undergraduate faculty member. Um, so you can kind of see my brief timeline here. In year one, I actually took graduate level classes to become a professor. Year two, I focused more on research, but I started doing teaching. I had a teaching internship with our partner school. Um, and in that time, uh, I was at Virginia Commonwealth University for this ARACTA fellowship, so in Richmond, Virginia. And our partner school, fortunately for me, was also in Richmond, so down the road at Virginia Union University, or VUU. And then my third year, I finished up doing, uh, focusing mostly on research and mentoring. Um, I liked my research so much at VCU. I was working in a um, intracellular bacterial laboratory with Jason Carlion. Even after my Arachta time and the teacher training officially finalized or finished up, uh, I continued in the lab for another two years just doing research and publishing some papers. Um, but during that time in those two years, I wasn't doing as much teaching. I realized teaching is just a big part of my life. Um, so despite having done 15 years of being a primarily a research scientist, um, it was time for me to step into a teaching role. And that brings me to where I am now. I'm an assistant professor at Virginia State University. So this is an HBCU located just south of Richmond, Virginia. We have about 40,000 primarily undergraduate students. Um, and you can see here a picture of our beautiful campus in Petersburg, Virginia. 
Um, if you can see in the picture, there's a water tower kind of back in the distance. My building is located right in front of that. And um, I started there in 2016 as an instructor. And within a year, I was able to apply um, and get accepted for the tenure track assistant professor position that I now have in biology. Uh, so hopefully by now, with that brief background, I give you an idea of how much research has really molded who I am as a person. Um, it gave me a lot of experiences and appreciation for all the teachers along the way that have really given me opportunities to try new things and to try to see where my, my interests are. I think that's something so important with our students, whether it's high school or undergraduate, is to give them opportunities. And I like to say this a lot, but to try before you buy. Try it out, see if you like it, uh, to do something, do a volunteer opportunity, do an internship. Is it something you like or is it not? Um, especially as students consider going to college or further on in their education, um, college is not a good fit for everybody. And so sometimes it's a really great thing for students to go out and volunteer or do internship opportunities to make sure that when they commit to that education program or that experience, um, they're committing for the right reasons because they're going to be more successful if, they're, if their heart is in it. Um, so speaking of where your heart is in it, uh, my research now comes back full circle to the research I started as a freshman at Cedar Crest College, so way back um, 21 years ago now, and that's doing research with these things called bacteriophage. Uh, so if you're not familiar, a bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. Um, the word or the uh, ending of the word bacteriophage, the phage part refers to eating, and so this essentially means bacteria eating virus. And just a kind of a rough description of what they look like, um, when we say bacteriophage, we're usually talking about a generic virus structure that looks something like this. So under an electron microscope, you would see this kind of spaceship looking mi uh, microbe. It has this head portion or capsid, and that's where its genome is located. A lot of the viruses that I work with have a DNA genome, but some can be RNA. And then they have this tail. Um, some of the tails can be very short, some of them can be long, and there are some bacteriophage that don't even have a tail at all. Um, but there's this tail, and then there are these tail fibers that extend off of it. And these tail portions are what allows for the virus to specifically interact with its host. So if you think about that kind of spaceship idea, the spaceship it has to find a good place to land. And so its landing spot, or where it's going to dock, are receptors on the surface of a bacterial cell. So bacterial cells have all kinds of proteins and receptor on their surface to allow for them to exchange with their environment. Well, bacteriophage, just like all viruses, they make use of that by binding to specific receptors. And once you have that interaction, it's like a lock opening up or a lock opening up with a specific key. And so the virus can then gain entry. And viruses, regardless if it's a bacteriophage or if it's a virus like the one that's causing COVID-19, their main agenda is to get into a host cell and make tons and tons of more viruses. Um, and that's the exact same thing for bacteriophage, except with these viruses, they are not a threat to humans. Uh, they will not infect our cells. They will not infect animal cells. These are predators of bacteria only. And here's a really cool electron micrograph picture where you can see a single bacterial cell in this like blue color. And this poor bacterial cell is being overwhelmed with many, many bacteriophage shown here in green. And so these are tailed bacteriophage. You can see their nice big green globular heads, and then you can see their tail portion, and then their tail fibers are doing the part that's interacting with the surface of the bacterial cell. And so after they have this interaction on the surface, the next step of the infection is that the virus kind of acts like a needle and syringe, and it injects this genome or this DNA through its tail and into the bacterial cell. And once that blueprint is in the bacterial cell, the, the bacterium is taken over and it is now turned into a virus making factory where the bacteriophage makes many, many copies of itself and it eventually bursts out killing the bacterial cell. So some fun phage facts, and please excuse the, the silliness. We always do fun stuff like this with the phage instead of having an F, we'll put a PH in there for phage. Um, so fun phage facts. Um, 
what most people don't know, especially um, if you're not familiar with bacteriophage or never heard of them until now, um, they are the most abundant microbe on the face of the earth. And so the estimate that is out there based on different um, studies and calculations is that there are 10 to the 31st power of these individual virus particles existing on the earth. Um, and that's a ridiculous number. Um, it is 10 nonillion, which I didn't even know that there was words to describe this beyond billion and trillion. Uh, it's 10 nonillion or a one with 31 zeros. Um, and that's hard to kind of fathom that there are many of those viruses out there because they're microscopic. We can't see them with the naked eye. So bear with me. If you're not a bug person, I apologize. But imagine if these viruses, instead of being microscopic on the nanometer scale, imagine now they were the size of like a June bug or some sort of beetle that you're used to seeing a lot of. So if these viruses were the size of a beetle, to give you an idea of how many of them there are on the earth, um, the, the earth would be covered with several miles deep of these beetles with 10 to the 31st power of them on the earth. And while that's quite a disturbing image to fathom, um, it just gives you an idea now that there are so many viruses out there, and not only that, but there are many of these bacteria phage. So they're in the dirt, they're in the soil, um, they're in the oceans, they're in streams. They are anywhere that bacteria can be found, including in our own bodies. Um, and interestingly enough, um, all of these phage that exist within marine sources, especially in um, ocean waters, they get kill, um, the viruses are killing off 40% of all the bacteria in those water sources every day. So this is a predator-prey predator relationship that results in high turnover of the bacteria. So the viruses infect, kill the bacteria, bacteria replicate very quickly, they make more of themselves, and it goes on and on and on. The really interesting part though is that there are all these bacteriophage that exist on the face of the earth. Yet we really don't know a whole ton about them. There are a few phage out there that are considered the canonical or the ones that we reference to a lot. Um, for example, phage lambda. It's a bacteriophage that infects E. coli. Um, that's one of the most characterized and studied bacteriophage out there. But that's one out of potentially 10 to the 31st virus particles out there, are many different types and varieties. We just don't know much about them. And for the most part, we don't know what their genetic or their genes uh, account for. We don't know what those genes encode for. Now, over time, bacteria phage have contributed to multiple discoveries in biology. I'm not going to go over these, um, but things that we now know as part of central dogma and part of the basics or foundations of biology, including genetic mutation, the fact that DNA is the genetic material. That was done with the Hersey Chase experiment using bacteriophage in the 50s. Um, and a lot of new molecular techniques, including the CRISPR-Cas system that is now being developed and used for um, healthcare purposes, um, that was developed using bacteriophage. So they've been a really useful tool over time. And funny enough, while the tool has been in the laboratory, not many groups have sat down and actually focused on the actual bacteriophage and all their capabilities in terms of genetics and their functions. So I already told you that bacteriophage don't cause human disease. Um, so they have, or they don't, I shouldn't say don't cause human disease. They don't infect human cells. They are primarily predating on bacteria. Um, so why do we care about them as human beings and how could they relate to healthcare? Um, well, they do infect bacteria that can cause human infections. Um, and so, there are a number of bacterial diseases out there. Some of these, uh, fortunately, are not as common nowadays, um, but there are a number of diseases out there that you may be familiar with that it's not the bacterium itself that's making us sick. It's because the bacterium is infected with a virus. And that virus is part of its genome has a toxin gene that whenever it is expressed inside the bacterial cell that it's infecting, causes the human disease. Um, so this includes, includes diseases such as cholera, different types of hemorrhagic diarrhea, so some types of food poisoning um, associated with like salmonella um, that gets onto our lettuce, for example, and they do all the recalls, um, botulism, and as well as diphtheria and scarlet fever. So those are all bacterial infections 
but those bacteria themselves are carrying an infection inside of them that makes us even sicker. And yes, you might have realized botulism on there or the botulinum toxin is listed on this chart. Um, and that is carried by Clostridium botulinum bacteria. And again, it's not the bacterium that's producing the botulism toxin itself, it's the virus infecting it that is expressing that. Um, so Botox is when they isolate that toxin from the infected bacteria and then use it for um, the muscle paralytic as part of our cosmetic procedures. So the bigger picture now though is to why study bacteriophage and besides the fact that it's been a really great research tool over the years is we're now finding that it's a really good tool in infecting or causing infections of bacteria that make people sick with different antibiotic resistant bacterial infections. And we call this phage therapy. And so essentially how this works is that if you had a bacterial infection, um, we would typically go to the doctor and get an antibiotic. Well, you're probably very familiar with the fact that some antibiotics are no longer useful or no longer effective against certain treatments or uh, treating certain types of bacteria. And so one alternative idea is using phage therapy where you have specific viruses that are able to infect these specific bacteria that are making you sick and be able to clear up the infection without causing the side effects that are common within antibiotics. Because antibiotics, when you take that, it's not only harming the bad bacteria causing your infection, it's also harming all the good microbiota of your body, the bacteria that live naturally on all your orifices and all your mucosal membranes, including inside of your guts. And that's why sometimes there's the nasty side effects of upset stomach and diarrhea is that the antibiotic is killing those good bacteria. But with something like phage therapy, you'd be using specific viruses that target the, only the bad bacteria and that would leave the good ones alone. So phage therapy was actually started being used right after World War II, um, but along came antibiotics and it kind of got pushed off to the side. But now with antibiotic resistance, there's a lot of surge and interest now in phage therapy. So why study bacteria phage? I already told you they're the most abundant mi uh, microbe on the face of the earth. And what's interesting though, is if you look into a lot of genetic databases in terms of sequencing for DNA, uh, there are more sequenced genomes from eukaryotes, so plants and animals and other higher order species than there are bacteriophage, even though these viruses are incredibly abundant. Um, and what's more, as I mentioned before, is that more than 70% of their genes have unknown function. And so there's a lot to be discovered here. If, what if those, those genes could be the next therapy for cancer treatments or better uses for clearing up bacterial infections or designing better products to um, target bacteria. As I already mentioned, CRISPR-Cas is a now system that's being used um, to prevent the, the production of certain gene products, and that was discovered using bacteriophage. Um, so there's a big push now to learn about these bacteriophage that are so abundant and do DNA sequencing to evaluate their genes. So that comes in with my research. The program I'm associated with is a nationwide program through Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And it's part of their umbrella program called the C, S E A, it's a Science Education Alliance. And under the C specifically, I'm part of a group called the Phages Program, appropriately uh, working with bacteria phage. But the Phages part stands for Phage Hunters Advancing Genomics and Evolutionary Science. And so this is what I now bring to my students at Virginia State. Um, and the whole purpose of this program is to find novel viruses characterize them in a laboratory setting using basic microbiology techniques, and then isolate and sequence their genetic material um, so that we can then look and compare viruses from different groups and different locations to one another um, so that we can learn to understand the diversity and start, start looking at um, some of these common genes within these phage groups and hopefully start to understand what are these unknown gene functions that they, they carry within their genomes. Um, this is just a, a, a diagram showing the family tree of some of the viruses that have been discovered so far with the C-phages program. Um, the colored bubbles represent family groups, just like a family tree. And so the closer together the branches are, the more related the viruses are. And hopefully just from this colorful schematic and all of the branches going everywhere, um, you can appreciate that there's a lot of diversity as well as a lot of similarity within these phages that we're finding. 
So here are some pictures of my students hard at work in the laboratory. Um, and what I like to do is uh, take my students at the freshman level, so straight out of high school with zero laboratory experience in many cases, and I give them basic microbiology teach techniques training, um, learning sterile technique, micropipette use, um, math calculations for calculating how to make different solutions, and they get to do a research project where they discover their own virus, so they have to go out and collect dirt samples from wherever, and they bring that uh, sample back to the laboratory where we weigh it, we isolate bacteria um, and virus samples from it, and then we begin this characterization process and try to isolate the virus. So the names of the viruses you're going to see here today were all named by my students. Um, I started this program in 2018, and uh, I, like I said, I'm a, I work primarily with freshmen, um, and it's a wonderful experience because they get so excited when they realize that they are able to do real research the first year of school um, within the first couple of weeks of their freshman semester. And it's really amazing to see how they come in um, thinking that they cannot do this. And then by the end of the semester, they're super confident, they're excited, um, and they just have a, a bigger outlook in terms of what they're able to do in science. Um, since I started the program, I've, all had, I've only had female students. Um, that's not by any selection on my end, it's just the way it happened when the students matriculate, um, they get to choose to sign up for the laboratory. Um, so my first year I had 10 students, um, and subsequent years I have about 12. And uh, we work one, pretty closely together in the laboratory um, when COVID is not happening, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but you can see them all here happily at work, and they wear lab coats, and they're wearing gloves, they're doing real science stuff. Um, they have to keep lab notebooks, and um, I have a small research space where they get to do all this awesome work. So here are some examples of their research that I wanted to share with you. Um, this is from my first year of the program that I had 10 students. We worked with a soil bacterium that you could find outside in your yard. It's called Microbacterium foliorum. And the program specifically looks with a lot within this family of bacteria called the um, Actinobacter species. And it's largely soil and water, so very commonly found bacteria. And so the main goal was to find new viruses that infect this particular bacteria. So the students had to learn to culture the bacteria, prepare the food to make it grow and make it happy. And then they would take their dirt samples, purify away all the other stuff, and then see if they have viruses. Um, and I don't think I have a picture here. I, I must have took that slide out for the sake of time. Um, but what they're able to do is to grow their bacteria on a culture plate, so a petri plate, and the bacteria, when it grows, it makes like a cloudy coating over the entire plate. Um, but when there's viruses there, they see these like little spots or dead zones on their plate, and that's where the viruses have essentially exploded out and killed all the bacteria. And when those students see the plaques, they're like, oh my gosh, we've discovered virus, and it's so exciting. Um, so from the 2018-2019 cohort of students, um, we found, I believe, 10 viruses that year, and um, we were able to isolate DNA and send off three of them for genomic sequencing. The students also prepared electron microscopy grids. That's something I didn't even get to do until grad school, so they get to do it as freshmen. And here you can see electron micrograph pictures of their viruses that they discovered. So these little lollipop figures here, these are three different viruses, um, Owens, Teddy Boy, and Sansafet. Um, and then that all happens in our fall semester, and it continues if the students choose to the spring semester, where we do a bioinformatics computer-based computer part of the class, um, where they analyze their DNA sequences, and they do what's called annotation. They try to assign where genes begin and end, and they kind of put together the whole picture of the genome and how it all works together for the virus. Um, and then the students actually publish that. So if you go on to the publicly accessible NCBI GenBank, um, and you were to type in Owens, Teddy Boy, or Sansafet, you would see the uh, genomes of these viruses now published there uh, with the students' names listed. So this is really exciting stuff that we've been able to do with our students. Um, oh, here's an example of that plaque picture I was telling you about. So here's a zoom in of a um, bacterial plate. The white cloudiness is the bacteria growing. And where are the students' viruses, you can see these white spots or these clear spots here on the white background. And those clear spots are, again, places where the virus has killed all the bacteria 
and it's literally a dead zone. Um, and then here's the electron micrograph for Teddy Boy. We have a uh, database called phagesdb.org. Anybody is able to go in there and look at that data. I'll show you that website on my last slide. Um, and you can see all the information about the student who discovered the virus, where they discovered it. There's GPS coordinates. So we collect all that information and it's now publicly accessible. So many groups across the country can now use our virus as part of their studies and learning about these genomes. Um, and so here's just an example of a genetic map that we made showing the color blocks or where the genes are located for one of our viruses. So this is Teddy Boy. This is the uh, database that I was telling you about that anybody is able to access. So you are able to access this if you wanted to share this with your students or look up viruses. It's called Phages DB. Or if you were to just Google C Phages um, database, you would probably come across it. It's phagesdb.org. And again, it has all of our viruses, not just from our school, but all the colleges across the US that are participating. Um, this is an older picture, but it has a keeps track of how many viruses have been sequenced so far as part of this initiative. And there's tons of genes that we're discovering um, along the way and seeing how related they are to other viruses out there. All right, so I think I stopped there because I could easily talk about this for a long time because I really love what we're doing with the phages work. The students really like it. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, we've, we're doing primarily the um, just the bioinformatics part with annotating genomes because that's the easiest to do online as opposed to trying to do the dirt samples. So I'm hoping for the fall we can get back to it and discover some more viruses. Um, but I'd be happy to take any questions from all any of you if you have any. Yeah, we do have some questions. Um, so the first one is, in terms of what we know about bacteriophage DNA, I guess how much do they have in common with eukaryotes? Okay, so in terms of I mean, like eukaryotes or viruses that infect eukaryotes, I don't know if anybody. Oh, so like how much are, like you know we have um, for like bacteriophages that have like DNA genetic material, like are do we have any common genes um, and any of that overlapping? Okay. Um, for the most part, no. So viruses in general, whether it's a bacteriophage or a virus that infects a person or an animal, viruses for the most part are considered a parasite. And so when they infect organisms, they travel pretty light. So think of them as bringing the smallest suitcase possible, and they only have with them the genes necessary to make more virus particles. And so on that note, they don't have any machinery or, or uh, mechanisms or metabolic, me metabolic properties themselves. They rely solely on the host for that. So um, in the case of bacteriophage, they're relying solely on the bacterial cell to provide the ribosomes and nucleotides and amino acids and everything it needs to make new viruses. Um, so in terms of genetic content, I would say the limitation to the similarity between like us, for example, and viruses um, is that there's some similarities between some human viruses and bacteriophage. Um, but in terms of eukaryotic genes, there, there are very few. If anything, um, the bacteriophage most closely resemble their hosts, which are the bacteria. And so sometimes we'll see some bacterial genes that are tucked inside the virus genomes that sometimes the viruses pick up and take with them when they leave one host and go to infect another. Um, so very few similarities with eukaryotic or organisms, um, but they do have some more similarities to their hosts. Um, and then in terms of similarities to like human viruses, about the only thing that they may have in common is that capsid structure that I showed you is kind of like the head part of the virus that holds the DNA inside. Um, there's some similarities between that protein with, for example, herpes viruses, which are also DNA viruses that infect humans. Um, but other than that, that's probably the extent of the similarities. Awesome. Um, and then, so another question is, um, in terms of make, turning bacteriophage, like doing having um, phage that fight um, bacterial infections, um, how does one go about doing that, that, like creating those bacteriophages? Yeah, so um, essentially you don't, you have to go looking for them. And that's the harder part with phage therapy. And what's being done now is that there are now institutes across the United States. I believe even the US Army is trying to build a bank of viruses that they can then put in the freezer that have been characterized by groups such as ours that then they can have kind of on supply 
um, in case there was a patient, patient or somebody who came down with an antibiotic resistant type of bacterial infection. Um, so if you were to Google phage therapy, there's some really inspiring stories out there. Um, the one that's close to home with us at Sea Phages is that um, there was a young girl in, I believe, the UK. She had cystic fibrosis and she had an infection with an antibiotic resistant bacteria that it was, it, was, it was going to be lethal. She probably would have died from it. Um, and then doctors from the UK reached out to the Sea Phages program. Hey, this is the type of bacteria that causes this infection. Do you have any bacteria phage in your freezers that have been discovered that, that couldn't in, kill this infection? Um, and they did. So they had several different viruses that were in the freezer from the Sea Phages program. They sent them to the UK and made a cocktail um, drug, which they de delivered to the, the, the young woman in, um, in her hospital in, uh, intravenously. So they injected it into her uh, and it saved her life. Um, and there's a couple cases of that now happening here in the United States as well. Um, it's not FDA approved yet, but it's getting closer to being there. Um, there's a really great book about it. Um, oh, it's called The Perfect Predator. And it's written by Stephanie Strathdy. Um, her husband was infected with an antibiotic resistant strain of bacteria while traveling and he almost died as well and they used phage therapy to save him. Um, so there's a big push now to discover as many bacterial phage that we can and put them into different databases, put them in the freezers in the event that if there is an infection or um, bacterial diseases that are caused by similar viruses that we can now, or excuse me, bacterial infections that could be uh, that could use similar viruses, we now have them on hand. Um, continuing on that theme, um, is there any significance of lysogenic of the lysogenic phage phase in the bacteriophage in the treatment of multi-resistant bacterial infections? Yeah, so for the most part, um, lysogenic refers to when the bacteriophage infect a bacterial cell, um, a, a, what we call it a temperate bacteriophage, it has an option of kind of going into like a hibernation state where it inserts its genome into the bacterial chromosome. So most viruses, if they're considered lytic, they go in, they infect, they make more virus, and then they kill the bacterial host and they release all those new virus particles into the environment. Um, with a tempered bacteriophage, they can go into this lysogen state, and that's the state that causes those human diseases that I was telling you about, where the bacterial cell itself is infected, but it's kind of infected um, more silently because you don't see actual virus particles inside the bacterial cell, you just see their, their DNA. So in terms of phage therapy, we largely want to destroy and kill the bacteria. And so there's a, a greater need for finding more lytic bacteria phage um, that we know that we could give potentially to a human being, have them infect their bacteria and then kill them because we don't want to have bacteria that are loitering in the body that could still persist and cause a prolonged infection. Um, all right, we have a question here that asks, are there course requirements uh, for the CFHS program? Interest in biology. That's um, a lot of my students coming in. They have, they have a variety of backgrounds in biology. Some of them have had wonderful training, um, but I pretty assume that they don't know anything other than that they are concurrently taking a principles of biology or introductory biology lecture. And so I try to time it so that when we're hitting on things like central dogma, talking about DNA to RNA to protein flow, when we really get to that in C phages, hopefully they've at least heard about it or started talking about it in class. Um, so trying to, I try to build on what they're getting currently and not basing it on anything that they've learned before. Um, because a lot of students will come in and they're just like, oh, I've never had I never talked about viruses before. I've never worked in a laboratory before. Um, they, they don't know what a micropipette is. So this is not, this is pretty much you can walk in just with a, an interest and I will teach you everything you need to know so that you can discover a virus and hopefully get some DNA out of it. Awesome, okay, one last question. Um, how many bacteriophages, phage strains have been discovered in soil? And then the follow-up oh to that is kind of, are they similar to each, are they, do you find that they're similar to each other? That's a great question. Um, so within the program itself now, um, I mentioned about going on to phages DB, you can kind of see the snapshot of how many viruses have been discovered. 
Um, and I haven't looked recently, but we're now getting into the thousands, which is super exciting because when the program started, I think there were maybe, you know, a hundred or something. Uh, so we're definitely discovering more. And what's really exciting is we're finding family groups of these viruses and they're being organized into what we call clusters. So those bubbles I showed you, that colored bubble map, our family tree, we're finding more and more branches on that bubble map. And um, we're finding that some of the viruses are extremely similar to each other. Um, and then there are some that are extremely different. And if sometimes they're so different, they're not related to anything we've seen before. And we'll call them a singleton, like a loner or something uh, brand new that we haven't discovered. Um, so we're learning a lot overall. And again, this is just students go out and collecting dirt. So depending on where they get their dirt from or the climate or the environment that they're getting from, um, we're seeing in some cases a lot of similarities, but we're also appreciating a lot of diversity in the viruses um, and infecting different types of bacteria as well. Awesome, thank you so much. I mean, obviously if we were in person, we'd all be clapping for you.